2010 Tabula Poetica Poetry Reading Series. After today with visiting poet Allison Joseph, we have one remaining poetry event this fall. The series concludes with a reading by our own Chapman University MFA students on November 30th at 5 p.m. in the Malloy Performance Portico. Raise your hand if you're one of those MFA students who's going to be reading. Okay, so come, come back to see these folks. You can find more details about Tabula Poetica and that MFA reading on our website and also on our Facebook group page. Before we begin, please make sure your cell phone is turned off. As I had mentioned before, there's food in the back of the room, and also Barnes & Noble has books by all this year's Tabula Poetica visiting poets available for purchase here at the reading, and we'll have time for book signing immediately after the reading. I want to acknowledge Poets and Writers, which through the James Irvine Foundation contributed grants to support each writer's visit. I want to thank the English department for tremendous support of all kinds for Tabula Poetica. In particular, thank you to Patrick Quinn, Patrick Fury, Logan Estale, Jim Blaylock, Lacey Walswick, Jennifer Klunk, Laura Silva, and Natalie Dave. Where's Natalie? Natalie's the graduate assistant for Tabula Poetica. Also to all my colleagues in the English department and in other departments who cheered on this growing project. We're also grateful to Dean Charlene Baldwin. Where's Charlene? There's Charlene. Give Charlene a round of applause. And admin Lori Gates and Leatherby Libraries for hosting all the readings. Thanks as well to the visiting poets, past and present. Where's Karen Emily Lee? Back in the all right, so there's a, a poet past, not too distant. Thanks to all the visiting poets, past and present, who, without exception, have been affable and insightful. These poets bring wide-ranging voices and aesthetics into the conversation that Tabula Poetica is designed to foster. I met some of them when they showed up for their first visit here, and I'm glad to know them all now. I knew Allison before she got here, and I'm especially pleased to welcome Allison Joseph tonight. To introduce Allison, we have the Chancellor. Hold on. <laughs> I'm going to say a few nice words about you two. Uh, Chancellor Strupa earned his PhD in mathematics from the University of Maryland, where I earned my MFA. Though for various reasons, we never ran into each other there. <laughs> He is no stranger to the arts and humanities and has encouraged Tabula Poetica since the moment he heard about the project. In fact, he's just said a few encouraging words, and I think we have places yet to go. Yeah. In an interview in Coast Magazine, Chancellor Strupa says, One of my first recollections is falling in love with the shape of numbers. I liked the number two. And I was inventing new symbols for the numbers above nine because I was disappointed that there would be no new pictures of the numbers. They were simply a combination of the first nine. <laughs> in other words, and these are my interpretation, perhaps he interprets it differently. In other words, his first forays in mathematics used an approach akin to that of an artist. Chancellor Strupa is the author of more than 100 articles and two books, He's directed and chairs, chaired centers, departments, and colleges, and of course now he heads up the academic side of Chapman University. He climbs mountains and jumps out of airplanes, and he is, as he sometimes mentions, he's Italian. It's come up in conversation once or twice. In fact, he's participated in the Chapman Reads Poetry video series available on the Tabula Poetica website by reading Dante in Italian. Please help me welcome Chancellor Daniele Struppa. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anna. That was a wonderful introduction, very kind of you. Um, I didn't know anybody who was actually reading Coast Magazine. <laughs> but I think it is true what you picked up, and I agree with your interpretation. I think I was drawn into mathematics because of its aesthetics, because of its beauty. So I think that that's really the strongest link between scientists and uh, especially mathematicians, 
<laughs> and uh, artists of every kind. It's really this kind of common passion for beauty and for the mystery of beauty and where can we find beauty. We find it obviously in different places and it takes different skills to discover it. But I think that that common thread is what brings us together. <coughs> um, I want to express my gratitude to all of you for being here tonight. This here is a wonderful crowd. I feel a little pang of jealousy because before coming here, an hour ago I was at the math seminar in the math department and there were five of us. <laughs> so when I left, 20% of the audience left. <laughs> so I, I compliment you for being here and uh, it's really, I think, uh, a testament to, to the value of what you're doing that, uh, that, that brings this kind of audience here and it's a pleasure to be part of it. I want to say a couple of words about the, the work that Anna has done. I mean, she really has brought a tremendous sense of purpose in, uh, in our department, the Department of English. And I'm so happy to see the energy that goes into this work and the passion that brings us all together. She mentioned that, that things are looking good, and yesterday we had the Board of Trustees and we approved our new budget for next year. And a portion of that budget, a bit modest, but it's going to be to support Tabula Poetica and your online journal. So I'm, I'm really happy that we are able to show in concrete ways that we support what you do and not simply by, you know, by words. Um, I want to obviously thank our uh, speaker for, for being here today. That's, uh, you know, I, she traveled quite a bit to be here, and yesterday night uh, she ran to a party just after landing with the airplane, so I appreciate really her willingness to be full part of this community. And now let me, let me say a couple of words uh, about uh, the, the speaker you're going to hear in a few minutes. Uh, Alison Joseph leads, writes, and, and teaches in Carbondale, Illinois. At, uh, where she is the director of the MFA program at Southern Illinois uh, uh, University. Uh, she did MFA, obviously, in creative writing. I should have added. She's the author of six books What Keeps Us Here, uh, Soul Training, In Every Scene, Imitation of Life, Worldly Pleasure, and more recently, My Father's Kites, uh, which I think I have some excerpt from here. And many of her books have won awards, like, like the Ampersand Press Women Poet Series Prize the John Zacharis Prize, and the World Press Poetry Prize. Um, she has received fellowships and awards from the Bread Love Writers Conference, the Seven E Writers Conference, and the Illinois Arts Council. She serves as editor and poetry editor of Crab Orchard Review, a national journey of literary works, and is the director of the Young Writers Workshop, a co-head residential creative writing summer workshop for high school writers. She moderates a creative writers opportunities list, which is a list serves that distributes submission and contest information to writers. So, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our speaker for tonight. Thank you. Never has the word Carbondale sounded so sexy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, not a, it, it's, it's not a sexy place, so it really sounds good when you say it. <laughs> So much for having me be part of the Chapman community. It's been a whirlwind day. I have had such a fabulous time. Uh, I want to thank Anna Leahy for bringing me here. Uh, and it's not easy to get a poet from the south of Illinois to the south of California. It, it takes several planes, a, a couple of shuttles, a few hotel rooms. But I am very happy that you chose me to be part of this very important and very influential series. Of course, here at Chapman, you get to experience it firsthand, but there are lots of us around the country who are clicking on the, the website and getting to hear readings by fabulous poets, and I count myself very lucky to be among them. So thank you, and thank you, and, and thank this lovely library. There is nothing better than a beautiful library. So I'm so happy to be here uh, and to read in this space. I'm going to read a few poems from this little book, this little chapbook called Voice, uh, and I'm going to also read from my latest full collection, My Father's Kites, which many of you have read for classes. I'm going to do the happy poems, and then the sad poems, and then go back to the happy poems. <laughs> because I think a, a poetry reading should have a kind of flow to it, so that you don't leave saying, my God, could she have depressed me more. <laughs> This little book is called Voice, and it's about the human voice and the poetic voice. And the first poem 
the title poem is called Voice. Voice. Nothing as naked as the human voice. It's cries of pain or pleasure. The whisper meant for you alone. The scream as flesh is slapped and startled into submission. The agony of the moment you hear your beloved is gone, crushed, unable to reside in your arms again, and you wail, pound fists on the walls, no coming up and out of you before you can stop it. Consider its registers, its hues, its tonal acrobatics, love of syncopation and lullabies. Scratchy, throaty, husky, meek, nasal, high-pitched, low-pitched, full of gravity or gravel, smoke or grease. When you hear my voice, you don't have to know anything about me. You don't have to know anything about me to know I love the motion of words through air, sound waves punctuated by breath, a music each one of us is capable of making. I love writing because I can play with language. And some poems are meant to be just pure play. And I've talked a lot about today about poems of grief and, and poems of loss, but I wanted to read something that was the exact opposite, that as far as you could get, uh, I guess you could call it the poem of procreation. Tourist attraction. Come play in my Graceland. Take a long, slow, dip in my reflecting pool, patriotic and aroused all at once. Come climb my monuments all the way up my arch and back down again, for truly I am the gateway to the West. Take a trip to my Empire State Building, where the observation deck is always packed, teeming with warmth and a certain giddy dizziness that comes with profound heights. Tour my zoos, urban menageries full of fins and feathers, downy nests and botanical wonders, flora, fauna, footprints. For you, I'm the painted desert, the fruited plain, the streetcar, subway, L and two, the English Channel and the Ivory Coast. Universal, I'm the great adventure. Roller coaster with so many happy loops. You scream when you finally plunge down, get off. For you, I'm waiting. No lines at my ticket booths. No charge at my welcome gates. I wanted to read that here because it has universal in it. <laughs> stories that other people have told. And usually uh, it's a very honorable impulse. Here's the legacy I'm handing down to you. That's why I write about my parents. But after both of my parents were deceased, were gone, um, and their contemporaries, their friends, and other relatives decided, okay, you're old now. You can know the truth about your parents. I'm like, oh, great. Did I really want to know that? What the elders tell you. When your parents have died and their friends are still living, they sit you down and tell you everything you didn't know and everything you have suspected about them, all the affirmations and confirmations you've been waiting for for so many years. They are your elders still, but now you are an adult maybe with children of your own, certainly with bills and mortgages, the depths collapsing, your expectations, hopes. 
because you are old now too. These elders tell you of all your parents' transgressions, the adultery, the drinking, the fractured friendships they never mended, redeemed only with their dying. The elders lean forward as they tell you these things, laughing with unfamiliar relish as they recollect their friends, shaking their heads in, dis in disapproval at the misdeeds of the dead. But did you want to know your parents were human? Weren't you planning on mourning them forever, stuck at the age you were when they died, never reconciling their adult lives with yours? Questions tumble from you faster than you can open your mouth, and the elders, with their shaky hands and graying temples, answer each one, not with the veiled dismissals of your youth, not with the sly winks and nudges that did not include you then, but with the truth, salacious and bitter and humorous, broken in ways you never expected. That's kind of a, a gateway poem to this book. Um, you, you figure out what people have been hiding from you all along. And I wrote this book in, in a chronological sense a long time ago. I began it probably in, we, we tried to pinpoint it earlier today, uh, probably in 1999, but I put it away for a long time. And, and sometimes you have to do that with your own work and able to, to look at it as work and not just a document of your own grief. Um, but the, there's a sequence of poems, the second section of this little book um, called uh, what the eye beholds, and I wrote it for my father, who I had a difficult and turbulent relationship with. Um, and the sequence opens with me finding the news, finding out the news that he has died, and it ends with the first, his first birthday after his death. Uh, so I'm going to read a few poems from this this collection, this little bunch of sonnets. Um, and, and talk a little bit in between them about how they came to be and why I chose this form. Long distance news. The instant I picked up and said hello, I heard a loud, loud, sharp knock at my front door. A city cop I'd never seen before handed me a note, passed me a note, then quickly turned to go. Scrawled on the note, call Henry Fabio. My father's friend? What should I call him for? I said out loud. I wanted to ignore this ominous coincidence, although I knew I had to pick back up the phone and listen to my cousin's sober voice. Is Daddy Joe? He's gone. She'd said the words I feared she'd say, her voice resigned in tone as she told me the news. I had no choice. I couldn't push away what I just heard. And that's how it happened. That's exactly how it happened. And I was grateful that my father's friend, um, who I call my uncle, he, he's not... In Caribbean families, everybody is your uncle or your auntie, and then you figure out actually later on who's related to you. <laughs> um, he, he's one of my, he was one of my dad's best friends, and I was so grateful that his last name ended in a vowel. It's like, I needed that for the rhyme. That really is his name. <laughs> he's from Trini. The way this the sequence began, well, I didn't know I was going to write poems. I didn't know I was going to write sonnets. I knew I was probably going to write about the profound, the profundity of the loss of losing one's parents is probably on that scale that they show of stressful life events. There's losing a child and probably losing a parent. Um, but I thought I was a pro at that because I'd lost my mother when I was very young. Um, still, I didn't, I didn't know how to deal with this grief. This is a poem called Personal Effects, Bronx County Courthouse, December 1997. His credit cards were in a plastic case, along with jewelry, pairs of gold cufflinks, 
The state health badge revealed my father's face. An older man, but still too young to sink down to the floor to die at 65. Efficient cops, they made me sign each page of a typed report of what he'd had alive. The house's deed licensed with proof of age he'd turned just weeks before. No time to mourn with pages slipping past for me to sign. The paperwork that seemed already worn. A claim to the remains he'd left behind. And then I passed the cops the page they sought. The funeral receipt. The coffin bought. I had to show them that I'd actually paid for the funeral before they would give me those objects back. And I, and I don't know what happens to people who can't pr produce that evidence, who can't afford a funeral. Um, I was fortunate enough that I, I had enough money that I could say, okay, here, I've bought the coffin. Give me a step. And I wanted to write about that really strange, almost surreal moment where you walk into a funeral, and whether it's someone who's related to you or not, you look down and you see the person and, and it doesn't quite process that that person is the person that you knew in life. And this was what came out of it. The first moment, the moment I first glimpsed my father dead, I thought the tears would flow immediately, his head against the coffin silk. Instead, I felt a laugh leap from my mouth for me, a burst of mirth, relief, and bitterness. He looked too good for death, too calm, serene, reclining there as if a little rest was all he showed up for. I didn't mean to laugh out loud, but strangely, I was proud to be the ha child of such a handsome man who'd stir out of the sleep if something loud went off, some noisy crash nobody planned. A kid ran up to touch this man who seemed to be wrapped up inside some lasting dream. So my father was from the Caribbean. He was from a tiny little island called Carriacou and grew up in a slightly larger island called Grenada. And the place we invaded during the Reagan years, you know. Um, they call it the Isle of Spice. It's hard when your country's whole economy depends on nutmeg. <laughs> When's the last time you used nutmeg, you know? That, that, was, that was it. And at the funeral, all these old Caribbean men came up to me and they started yelling, Presentation College! And I was like, what did you just say to me? They were my father's high school classmates. What we referred to high school, they referred to as college. Um, so they were saying, I went to high school with your father. And they all seemed a little tipsy. I don't know if they'd, have, they'd gone to the Grenada Benevolent Association meeting before and they'd have something to drink and then they came to the funeral. Um, but, uh, so I'm confronted with these men and, and I decided to write about them. Countrymen, my father's college classmates shake my hand. They smell of alcohol, have roomy eyes. They stare at me, exclaim, then recognize the features that remind them of the man who'd left behind their small, obscure island just as they'd done. They each seem slight in size, their hands a tremble as they eulogize their comrade from that faraway homeland I've seen in person only once. They say he loved his girls, that he was proud of all his daughters had become. I don't reply, just nod my head. I'm here to play the role of grieving child who's not allowed to speak of memory's truth when others won't. So another thing about my dad was that he was an atheist, not a philosophical, calm, here's my rational argument for why God does not exist kind of atheist. He was the, when you're dead, you're dead. It. There's no God. You throw you six feet under and you're dead. He was that kind of atheist. Which was difficult because during my mother's illness, um, she had a spiritual conversion. Um, we'd always been sort of a, a, a C and E family, you know, Christmas and Easter. So it made it, it made it difficult. But 
Well, so we're back to a very a person who did not believe in God, and all of a sudden everybody wants to get religious. How sweet the sound. At graveside, someone starts to sing aloud. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I think about the song, its words profound, but far from music Father would have picked for this event. He would have had us sing a song that didn't mention saving grace, denying any kind of lord or king. He'd tell us all a smirk upon his face to play some jumping jazz or raucous blues, an Armstrong strut or John Lee Hooker dirge, the so kind of songs a man like him would choose, no Christian hymns for him, no sudden urge to have salvation make this day less grim. Imagine how he'd laugh to mock this hymn. And this is just something for me. Often when you write poems, you tuck things in there that you know about that you can't expect your audience to know. And I don't expect you to know, but the reason John Lee Hooker is mentioned, other than he's like a fabulous blues, it was a fabulous blues musician, um, one of the things that I found in the house when we went back to, to clean up the house um, was a John Lee Hooker cassette. And the title of the cassette was Never Get Out of These Blues Alive. And I'm like, how apropos. <laughs> How wrong and how right. So my dad was this rapier wit, sharp-witted, kind of evil, God-denying man. Oh yeah, and he hated white folks too. Um, I, I really wish that he had lived to see Barack Obama get elected simply because I know he would have made fun of his name and gotten away with it. Um, because, you know, he would have made fun of, he made fun of everyone. And he had a particular affinity for puns. Um, and I went to a very small liberal arts college um, where I was one of a few African American students there. And the only time my dad saw it was dropping me off where somehow to get to Central Ohio, we went through Cleveland, and um, picking me up on graduation day. And uh, Canyon has a very literary reputation there. People like Robert Lowell and James Wright and uh, E.L. Doctorow uh, connected to the school in one fashion or another. Um, and there was a famed poet who taught for many years and edited the Canyon Review, a gentleman named John Crow Ransom. Yes, you have to bring yourself up when you say that name. <laughs> um, and this was a, a, a occasion for my dad's wit to come out. Graduation day, Kenyon College, 1988. How to give a little black girl like you a Jim Crow Ransom poetry prize? <laughs> My father asked that graduation day. The senior class milled happily, not sure yet what to do, degrees in hand. My father never knew who John Crow Ransom was. Still, he unmasked the whiteness of that place, its story past, replete with narrow-minded people who he thought he'd wisely taught me to despise. Now, I had claimed a place among them all, the very whites he tried to demonize for years. My er newly earned degree felt small and insignificant. He thought my prize did nothing more than signal my shortfall. What I loved about assembling the sequence was being able, like my, my, my fiction writer friends, they move back and forth in time, and poets don't do that as much, but Putting this together, I could move forward, I could move back. Um, I'm going to read this poem that folks uh, talked about in, in class. Um, it name checks many cartoon stars. Um, parade of cartoon stars. I watch a cartoon cat pursue a mouse. Remember how you'd grin at their hijinks. Your cackle would resound throughout the house, such pleasure in their animated tricks of booby traps or guns or powder kegs. 
you'd sing the Jetsons theme, or the Flintstones, or laugh at olive oil, her scrawny legs. I didn't think it weird to find you home, amused by Jerry Mouse and Tom the Cat, Quick Draw, McGraw, and Huckleberry Hound, not wondering where other dads were at, but knowing mine preferred to stay homebound. The cartoon characters were all that moved, at least until the sales climate improved. Yeah, my father pursued that American dream, and this is true of, of lots of people's parents, of being the self-made man, being the salesman, and he sold all sorts of different things from insurance to plants at various types of times in his life. So, I didn't really know my father had a brother. I met him once. Um, but after his death, I found out, hey, I have an uncle. He's living in Florida. He sounds like my dad, but happy. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have that, that bitterness inside of him. So it was the occasion when I had uh, my first phone call with him. My first phone call with my uncle. His voice sounds like my dad's, but less intense. Familiar island accent without strain. I listened as he patiently explains. My dad and he were brothers in the sense they shared a common father, not a home. My grandfather neglected both his sons, responsibilities he chose to shun, a world beyond that island he could roam. When last I saw my uncle, I was two. My sister eight. We couldn't say we'd met this rival father wanted to forget. You can't keep bitterness inside of you, my uncle says. You can't hold on to it. A notion father never would admit. So this, the death hit me hard when I was going through it, but it really hit me hard a year later. And I have this theory that grieving takes a full year and it takes a whole year for you to really feel the effects, and you never know when you're going to feel it. And, and though our relationship was strained, I would send my father Christmas cards or cards for his birthday, and when we went home, I found all the cards in a neat package, uh, banded with rubber bands, and I thought, oh, my father loved me after all. And I opened up the uh, rubber bands, took the rubber band off, and turned each card over, and then there were rows and rows of lottery numbers. Those cards were scrap paper. Yeah, that's how I felt. I've heard someone go, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's how I felt. First birthday after your death, November 1998. This month I will not pace a card shop's aisles in search of words that I could send to you a birthday card to ship across the miles in hope some correspondence could ensue. A letter in return where you could share the ordinary details of your life, not revelations showing how you cared or mourning for the absence of your wife. This month, I will not wonder if you read the tepid verses on your birthday card, the envelope not falling by your bed, along with other mail you disregard. No longer will I do what I have done. I'll hope to read my father's answers gone. I want to read some of the other poems in the book that are formal poems that uh, aren't sonnets. Um, this poem is a villanelle, which is a 19 line form that has certain repetitions embedded in certain places in the poem and probably the best best known example is uh, Elizabeth Bishop's wonderful poem, One Art. The art of losing isn't hard to master, which of course she means that ironically. I mean, if I were to rewrite One Art, it would be the art of losing isn't hard to master, it's a bitch. You know, <laughs> it's, you know it's, not hard, it's not easy to write about losing someone, no matter how complicated or how uncomplicated it is. And those greeting cards, yes, had lottery numbers because my dad was a compulsive gambler and not going to Atlantic City kind of compulsive gambler. Uh, the kind
kind that you see in every neighborhood. It goes to the grocery store and has a pile of tickets leaving. And, you know, one ticket, two tickets. No, when we went back, we cleaned out garbage bags full of tickets. The payoff. Instant riches, lucky numbers, my father knew those games, horse races, scratch-off cards, his fever rose as jackpots grew. Not one ticket, not merely two, he bought as many as he could hoard. Instant riches, lucky numbers, my father knew a life of trying to accrue the kind of luck he couldn't afford. His fever rose as jackpots grew. Every night he would review a pile of tickets he'd discard. Instant riches, lucky numbers. My father knew the lore of easy revenue. Compulsion hit my father hard. His fever rose as jackpots grew. He spent his cash as bills came due with losing tickets, his reward. Instant riches, lucky numbers. My father knew. His fever would rise as jackpots grew. And to prove that I am his daughter, I have been in casinos late at night pulling, well, you don't pull the handle anymore. The handles are just there for ornamentation. You hit a little button over and over and over again. And I realized, hey, I have that addictive tendency too. Uh, and, and they strategically take all the clocks off. There are no clocks, there are no windows. I, I spent you know, hours in front of this I dream of genius slot machine. <laughs> it kept going, yes, master. <laughs> With every tiny little play out, it would go, yes, master. <laughs> yeah, all the, all the, if you've ever been to a, a casino, all the slot machines are based on like television programs from our childhood. It's bizarre. So I'll read the happy poems now. Love poems. So I married a white dude. Yeah, I didn't tell my father. Um, somehow the very thing he told me not to do, I ended up doing. But I married a white dude who knows just as much about black culture as anyone I've met. And we met um, in writing school, uh, in MFA school. And I sat down next to him, told him my name, and told him where I was from, and I asked, what's your name? He said, my name's John, and I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. And I said, Little Rock 9? And he said, Central High, 1957. So I knew I could trust him. <laughs> and uh, uh, the other way you know you can trust someone is if you size up their record collection or their music collection. And I don't know how you youngsters do it now, because everybody's really interior with their music. Maybe you like, check out their, their laptop and see what's on it. It's like, nope, can't date him. <laughs> no, can't stand what she's got on there. But I knew it because he had all the Bob Marley albums. And me, me being the daughter of a woman from Jamaica, that immediately appealed to me. Um, so this is a, a love poem for my husband, John. It's called, My Husband Plays Me Marley. My husband plays me Marley more than any white man born and bred in Arkansas should. So much that I think any day now he will wake with a head full of dreads. Big split between his lips like Marley's on the album covers. In this age of MP3s, he actually owns the albums. Even the one where the cover tells you how to clean herb. <laughs> Though I'm the one with the mother from Jamaica, he's the one leading me through get up, stand up, and Rastaman Weber Esha An. I guess that makes me Rita to his Bob. And I'm so glad to sing with him, to give thanks and praises to a God I wouldn't refer to otherwise. He makes me name each whaler, fills me with stories of Bunny and Peter Tosh. Bunny could sing while Peter talked his way through a song. Marvels with me at how much Ziggy looks like his dad, even, even if the younger Marley isn't nearly as astonishing musically. I think Bob would smile if he knew us, laughing at my husband even though he's a crazy bodhead, a white man like the white captain who married Marley's 18-year-old mother, only sent money after their son was born. When my husband croons, no woman, no cry, he changes the words, sings the name of our town instead
instead of trench town. And I began to think I could live anywhere with him, any place we could open windows, drapes, let in a pale imitation of the sun, Marley Moon. Nowhere we can go where Marley can't follow, singing sweet songs, melodies clear and true. This is Marley's message to us, and we are grateful this messenger once walks, walked this earth telling us every little thing is gonna be all right. And we listen, dance to his voice in the light of our lives. Now, I was challenged to write a poem that had to do with oral fixations and probably giving me that assignment was not a, I don't remember what it was for. It was for an anthology that the, they didn't accept the poem, but I wanted to try it anyway. Um, so of course I wrote about eating uh, because why not? Uh, this is a poem called Eating Out. And yes, I did realize afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and the other thing is, I live in an area of the country that is restaurant deprived. I'm going to go home, and people are going to be excited about the opening of a Chili's. That is how sad it is. Yes, there are such places, and, and it will be full. It will be freaking packed. <laughs> Also, fashion challenge, because I'm going to go home and they're going to open the TJ Maxx and I'm going to be like so happy about that. <laughs> I love the Maxx. And probably if they had asked me to write an occasional poem for its opening, I would have been there. It would have been a Sestina with Max at the end of the line. <laughs> this is a poem called Eating Out. Don't you love that moment when they place the menu before you, all your choices spelled out in details of tarragon or fennel, star anise, or roasted chile. I love that moment, too, when the waiter goes through his litany of specials, the curry poached, glazed, drizzled, blackened, sauced, blanched, broached, roasted. One day only, sorry, we run out of that dish, dishes. They candied, sinful, chocolate rich, creme de menthe, devil's food, strawberry sauced, and raspberry tarted desserts. It's like the orgasm before the orgasm. The minor ripple that precedes the blast your body knows is full pleasure. So go ahead, order the soup. Let its creamy warmth slide over your tongue in pursuit of the apt taste buds. Have the appetizer, white cheese and olive oil softening the crusty coat of bread wedges. Taste something you have never had. Can't pronounce enoki mushrooms, arugula, creme fraiche, or vote. Eat slowly, for you did not cook this yourself, nor did someone hand it to you in a paper bag with plastic forks. <laughs> Don't just chew, but lick, savor, your tongue caressing the roof of your mouth, flavors you've hoped for all week, finally here, flooding your mouth. When you're sated, sigh. What I hope for you is a whole lifetime of those kinds of sighs. And the other thing about that poem is that it is on the wine list at a fabulous restaurant called Tom's Place in DeSoto, Illinois, um, which is a five-star wine spectator rated restaurant. And it's a long, long story, but uh, an internationally known chef who was responsible for creating the food in the movie Babette's Feast. This is his restaurant. And it's in the middle, literally in the middle of nowhere in Illinois. That's how much he wanted to own his own place. You know, he was out here in California and he couldn't, couldn't afford it. Um, and that poem is on the wine list. So I have read that poem to many a drunk patron. <laughs> and it's amazing how people's capacity for poetry goes way up when they've had a few glasses of Merlot. And they start speaking Chardonnay's to you. <laughs> I, I'm 
myself speak Merlot-ish. <laughs> so I'm going to read two more poems. It's a two-poem warning. Sometimes it's good to do that, to give people, eh, okay, this is going to be over soon. Um, I have the great honor of working side by side with another poet, a gentleman named Robbie Jones, who is one of America's finest poets, and he's also incredibly funny. And I have the great pleasure of eating lunch with him practically every day of the week you know, when we're in school. And we were fighting over a sugar packet. That's how this poem came to be. I told people earlier, I will write about anything. Don't. Don't be fingering my sugar unless you want to taste my salt. Teasing my honey, then ignoring my bitter. Satisfied with a simple taste of sweetness, uncomplicated by tang, by sour, by vinegar that clarifies as it cleans. Don't grab my bottle, drink my liqueur, then replace it when you feel like it. Sipping, slipping me peach brandy when I sip creme de menthe. Don't page my book with slippery hands. Splatter grease on sheets I haven't read or slept on, leaving stains I can't get out. Don't undo my hooks and eyes until you set your own zipper straight, your buttons lined up with the right holes, snaps set into their grooves until I decide otherwise. Come correct, then maybe I'll let you graze my grain, sweep my floor, brush a fingertip pleasure soft enough to stir my dead, firm enough to make them sleep again. And it just came from fighting over a sugar packet. <laughs> I love that about poetry. You can take the tiniest little thing and just run with it. Okay, this is the last poem. And it comes from my predilection as a teacher to tell people, even they, they, they may not even be my, my poetry class. I'm like, you should write a poem about that. Write that, you, you gotta do, I like that that um, cousin at the family barbecue, you gonna eat that? <laughs> I like that with like straight lines that people just comment or say. It's like, if you're not using that, <laughs> I would like to use that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm always telling people, write about this, write about that. And the part of a creative writing teacher's life is to get people to see the possibility, the possibilities for writing in their own lives. Lots of people think, Oh, if you're a writer, you have to write about something that has no relationship to you, and it has to be incredible, incredible, and you have to go to Italy and look at paintings. And while I would love to go to Italy and look at paintings, I, you know, I, if I did, I'd probably write about, you know, the lecherous guys peering at me from around, you know, David or something. <laughs> so, this is a poem called Prompt. Prompt in the sense of something that prompts you into writing, into utterance, not necessarily on time. <laughs> I've noticed that there's a thing called California time. <laughs> the prompt. Write me a poem about the last good bar room brawl you witnessed. How the patrons spilled out of their seats at the smack of fists on flesh. Write me a poem about the last peacock you saw. How the sly unfolding of feathers could still stop you as you pivoted through the zoo. Balloon in one hand, three year old in the other. Write me a poem as loud and dissonant as the county orchestra tuning up, lazy as the lisp your cousin didn't relinquish until eighth grade. Write something to keep me awake a long after nightfall with lines that will lodge in my head so fiercely a month will have to pass before I can breathe again. Write me a poem that smokes that leaves ashes in my bed, thumbprints on my skin. Write a poem for me with your shoulders, backbone, a poem that can hold the brusque angles of elbows, sleepy cast of eyelids. Write me a poem and make it so fine, I want it more than my own poems, my own breath and blood. Thank you so much.
and we'll need to repeat the question on the Okay, on my sure. Hi. Hi. Um, I just want to say it was a very good uh, reading. I really enjoyed it. But uh, one of my major questions, just as a writer in general, is um, why do you write? What inspires you to write your poetry? Is it just the little things you see, or is there some overall arching belief that you have? What drives you to pen and paper? I can't sing. <laughs> uh, I'm like, Chancellor Strupa, I can't do math. Um, really bad at the, at the science. Even though I love science, I actually, the actual conducting of the experiments kind of went awry, which is kind of ironic since I went to a math and science high school. Um, this was what always spoke to me. Language always spoke to me. Even when I was a small child, the mythology in my family went was when, um, when we were in Canada and I went to school, I knocked the teacher's socks off by picking up a book and reading. I don't know how true that was. I was four. I don't know if that's just one of those family stories. But I was always drawn to language much more than anything else. So when you ask me why write, I, 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 the real answer is why not write? I mean, I cannot not write. Um, just like painters can't paint, and those who dance, who can really dance, not those who think they can dance, <laughs> but those who really can live it and breathe it. So for me, uh, poetry is always, it wasn't just, I need to express my poetry. Uh, we all have that. I think we all have a need to find an outlet, but I was drawn to it, and I had a talent for it, and I knew it, because I knew all the other things I couldn't do well. Um, what drives me to write day to day are those things I observe, are those people I meet, are those the sugar packet fighting over the sugar packet. Just whatever sparks sparks me into language. And I've been writing long enough that I know what what sort of things will make me write. Um, and uh, whenever I feel a project coming together, that's always a, a sort of happy time, even if I've tried to push it away, which I have actually done sometimes. I tried to push this book away because it was you know, kind of scary. It's like, who wants to see? Who wants to see the record of your grief and the fact that you were a miserable failure as a parent Miserable failure as a as a daughter. Hey, that sounds like a downer. <laughs> so, I I have always thought of myself as a writer too. It's always been something that, in in my case, made life easier. A lot of people, a lot of writers complain about. This is why I don't write much prose, which is a whole other animal. But to me, poetry is there's an element of poetry that's very playful, even when you're writing about such dark things as, as losing a parent. Uh, with those poems, I still had a fair amount of play going on because I was working with that particular form and needed the form and, and relied on the form to get, get the poems actually onto the page. Any other questions? Um. Musical. It's not identical to, say, song lyrics, because song lyrics are very dependent on the music, but there's a music in language, in ways you decide to put words together. Certain words sound good when you put them up, rub them up against other words. And they have to be together, or, and certain words sound very discordant, elbowing each other out of the way. So, yeah, if, if there was something musical about what you heard tonight, Thank you. <laughs> it means I, I did something right. If there's something that uh, appealed to you on the level of not just what I was saying, but how it was phrased, um, that's one of the aims and goals, I believe, of poetry to put together phrases that are euphemous or sometimes.
sometimes get caught up in this, but that stay with you, that stick with you, and have that, that perception of motion. therapeutic for me, for me, the, the, the person, but it still had to work for me, the artist, it still had to be representative of what I, the best I could put on the page, so, and that was another reason I put it away for so long, because I wanted to be able to get that perspective, to be able to view it as, this is something I made, not just something I did to deal with being grief-stricken, and that, that process took a long time, you know, literally having it out of my sight and working on other poems and publishing other books. In the meantime, it was it was a good thing. Okay, I think we need to wrap up so that we can do some book signing. Thank you all for joining us.